CNN tends to be a pretty pro-Israel outlet, but every now and again, the truth is breaking through. Nima el is the channel's chief international investigative correspondent, and she explained to Wolf Blitzer what happened when she tried to see Palestinian detainees released in Jerusalem. That was as part of the Israel-Gaza prisoner exchange. You were outside a prison in Jerusalem where Palestinian prisoners were released and reunited with their families. What did you see? Well, Wolf, we weren't allowed to see anything. Uh, Israeli authorities blocked off roads, corralled the media into one location, um, brought the Palestinians in uh, through the back door when they received them, and then only allowed family members to come in very limited single file in individual cars. And there's a reason for that. Because unlike uh, the images of celebration, where you, which you might have seen from Ramallah and the West Bank, here in East Jerusalem, Israeli authorities were better able to enforce the diktat of their far-right national security minister, who has, who has deemed the prisoners released today as terrorists. But not just that. He said any Palestinian who celebrates will themselves be charged as terrorists. I mean, just to break that, break, break that down a little bit, there is no grounds to call them terrorists because by Israel's own reckoning, those 39 pr prisoners were uh, 15 minors, 10 of whom were only charged, and 24 women, 23 were, sorry, were detained, not charged, and 10 of the minors were detained, not charged. It's, it complicates telling this story. So imagine your daughter has come home to you and you have to hide indoors to express your joy. Now, I think that report was really important for two reasons, right? First, it blows open the Israeli lie that the people they detain are terrorists. Right? They're often not charged. They have no idea why, why they are there. It is actually more like a hostage situation. Right? These are captives. These are, it, it, Israel's always trying to say, oh, you know, Hamas released hostages. We're releasing um, terrorist suspects. No. They're often releasing people who have no idea why they've been detained in the first place and that have been detained for indefinite periods of time without ever knowing um, when they will be released. Um, second, the second thing, um, that I think that report showed, is how the most normal expressions of love and family life are suppressed by Israel when it comes to the Palestinians. Now, imagine you have a daughter who's been kidnapped from you, yet when they are returned, you'll be charged as a terrorist if you publicly celebrate, right? That's dystopian. Not only has your kid been kidnapped, but when they're returned, if you celebrate, then suddenly you're a terrorist and you're liable to get kidnapped, right? Dystopian. Let's go back to the report. I want to show you this video, Wolf, of a, a daughter reuniting with her mother that was sent to us by the family. Take a listen. That young lady you see there, the reason, I mean, I can't, there's no reason, it's her daughter, but beyond that, uh, she had been arrested at the age of 16, uh, convicted at 17 for 10 years, accused of uh, attempted stabbing. Her family and her lawyer and Israeli and Palestinian rights groups say that this was a miscarriage of justice. Her family had taken this all the way to the Israeli Supreme Court and her mother had lost hope. So the idea that uh, Israel's far right figures are demonizing Palestinian joy in this moment is part of a bigger picture, Wolf, that we have seen play out where they're not distinguishing between Hamas and civilians, Wolf. It's really, really moving, impressive report. And as we said on a previous show, Wolf Blitzer, so the host there, used to work for the Israel lobby, APAC, the Israel lobby group APAC in, in the United States, are the most important one there. So him hosting that kind of exchange could seem significant. I mean, Ash, do you think that's significant? I think it is significant. And we've seen Wolf Blitzer in previous segments articulating his shock and even dismay at IDF commanders who are trying to argue that they're only targeting military infrastructure and that their response in the Gaza Strip has been proportionate to their military objectives. So maybe he's going on a bit of a journey. And I don't want to downplay 
the importance of that kind of footage. I think in particular where there has been an implicit media competition over whose suffering gets to be seen, whose suffering gets to be uh, represented, whose suffering gets to become politically meaningful between Israeli and Palestinian civilians. It's obviously really important to show that kind of footage and also, I think, um, shine the light of truth on the Israeli narrative about who these people are um, and, and show that narrative up for what it really is. But I think that this footage, it's also within a sort of script of acceptable depictions of Palestinians. It's terrorists or perfect victims. And a more, I think, nuanced political understanding of what it means to live under occupation what that does to a people and its political institutions, that's the thing that you're not allowed to do because, of course, those political institutions are just meant to be terrorists. So it doesn't shift the frame that much, but I'm also not denying its overall importance. What do you think of the fact that, you know, it, it, you get called a terrorist if you publicly celebrate the return of someone? You know, it's... It does seem dystopian, sort of in the sort of quotidian control of people's lives. Not only are you detaining people, you're policing how emotional someone can be in public, right? Celebrating the return, I suppose, because if they, you know, if they saw people celebrating the return of these people, that would suddenly raise the question: Well, were they really terrorists? You know, like it humanizes um, the the victims of their intern policies, and that's precisely what they don't want, right? So this is almost a sort of PR thing. Yes, we will we will release some people because that means that Hamas will release some of our people, um, but we don't want this to be an opportunity for the world to sort of notice the fact that we do arbitrarily detain people's kids. You talk about the sort of dystopian pettiness of banning celebrations. This is something that Israel has a very long history of. So for years, it was against the law in Israel to make art which used the colors white, red, green, and black. Um, because of course, those are the colors of the Palestinian flag. And that's part of how the watermelon became a symbol of Palestinian resistance. Because if you couldn't use the colors of the flag in your work because that would be seen as pro PLO propaganda because it uses the colors of the Palestinian flag. Well, you would sort of point to this object in nature, which has the colors red, white, green, and black. But that was an exceptionally petty measure. And it was in Israeli law for a very long time. Um, you know, it's even the case that Palestinians are limited in how much rainwater they can collect because in Israel's view, uh, that's part of Israeli sovereignty. It's an Israeli natural resource. I mean, these things are hugely petty. And I think that, yes, there's a PR angle to it, but it's also part of how colonial domination works. It has to be totalizing and it has to be intrusive because the minute it's not, and the minute that people have some degree of autonomy, well, that begins to translate into political autonomy, and that undermines a colonial project. 